Hello and welcome again to a virtual lecture in Anthropology 175, Peoples of the World. Today our topic is going to be the anthropological concept of culture. And I want to begin with a general overview that summarizes the whole model of culture that on which I'm going to lecture. Uh, I want to begin by um, suggesting that all humans act from ideas, which they learn from others, and which are embedded in the material environments and social networks in which they live, and which they then tend to reproduce, habitualize, and pass on to new members of their society, unless circumstances encourage change. So what we're going to do in the rest of this lecture is we're going to sort of unpack this uh, in greater detail by looking at some of the features of culture. I want to begin by making three key points about culture. First, that culture is a fundamental human trait. Second, culture is something that people have, a shared system of knowledge and assumptions and values that defines them as like and unlike other people who have other cultures. And third, culture is something that is generated through encounters. Most people think their cultural practices are not learned behaviors, but are natural and normal and fundamentally human. It is often only through encountering others who have different cultural practices that we know that what we do is cultural and not some part of human nature. Okay, let's take each of these points separately, and let's begin with the first one, that uh, culture is a fundamental human trait. In this sense, culture is about the human need for meaning. Humans don't act on instinctive behaviors hardwired into our brains, but on learned sets of ideas about the world that are not only in our heads, but are also expressed by the people around us and the material environments that we and those who came before us have shaped. One way to think about this is to think about some of the ways that these cultural models differentiate us from other animal species. All animals eat but only humans have meals. Only humans create rules about what edible things are food and what edible things cannot be eaten. Only humans uh, invent cuisines and rules for dining and assign particular kinds of foods to particular kinds of meals that are supposed to be eaten at particular times and in particular places. Only humans develop material culture specifically for eating food correctly, like silverware and plates and specialized cups. Similarly, all animals mate, but only humans marry. Only humans elaborate, elaborate their mating with rules and rituals and ceremonies, with sets of rights and responsibilities, with legal contracts and sacred myths that are invoked in marriage rituals. All animals produce offspring, but only humans have families. My oldest daughter used to save stray cats from the streets of Cairo. We noticed that within a year of a kitten's birth, there was no behavioral evidence that the two cats recognized that they were mother and offspring. Humans, on the other hand, name their kin relationships and assign rights and responsibilities to family roles and create elaborate genealogies. In sum, all human beings live in worlds that are filled with meaning. These meanings are crucially important because they orient us in the world. They give us values to pursue and strategies to pursue those values. And they allow us, therefore, to act in the world effectively. Yet, the specific meanings through which we act in the world differ from one society to another, from one culture to another. These learned systems of meanings that are shared by particular groups of people are what anthropologists mean by culture. Now, every cultural anthropologist defines culture differently. There's no universal shared definition of culture. Anthropologists agree pretty widely on some of the characteristics of culture, however, so that's the approach I'm going to take here today. Most anthropologists agree that culture is symbolic, shared, learned, and adaptive. Well, what does it mean to say that culture is symbolic? A symbol is something that stands for something else to someone in some respect. 
In this picture, for example, a black-robed hand holds up a scroll tied by a ribbon. Now, at one level, that scroll of paper stands for a college diploma. When you graduate, however, and get a scroll or a diploma case, the diploma is not actually there. That diploma, that certification of your graduation, will come later in the mail. So the scroll or case stands for the diploma. Now, interestingly, that diploma, which looks so good framed on your wall, is itself a symbol. It stands for the degree that the university granted you. But the diploma isn't the degree. If you lose the diploma, the university can issue you another one, because the degree, which has no physical reality, is what is socially real, while the diploma, which exists physically, just stands for it symbolically. And at yet another level, the scroll stands for many important social values. It could stand for education, training, social mobility, adulthood, independence, and many more things. Choosing between all these possible meanings is partly determined by who the, is interpreting the symbol. The scroll or diploma, degree, uh, mean different things to the graduate than to her employer or to her parents. But the meaning of the symbol also varies according to the social context in which the symbol is being interpreted. Now, the fact that culture is symbolic has two very important consequences. First, it means that culture is communicative. Our actions always mean something to ourselves and to others. No matter how pragmatic they are, they also have a social uh, dimension that can be interpreted by those around us. They communicate messages. Every action, no matter how mundane, has a communicative aspect if it is seen by others. And the second point is that these meanings are, by and large, arbitrary. Um, that is, there's nothing natural or essential about any system of meaning. Uh, one of the best uh, ways to illustrate this comes from the domain of language. There's no natural connection uh, between this quadruped and any of the many words in many languages that refer to it. And just as the meaning of these words are a matter of social convention, so are the meanings of most of our actions, our objects, our gestures, and so forth. To summarize, culture operates through symbols, including language, objects, gestures, and sounds. This means that everything that we do as members of society has a cultural meaning, which communicates as well as whatever practical functions our actions might have. The meaning of the symbols through which we communicate, however, are particular to people who learned them by sharing common experiences. The second key characteristic of culture is that it is shared. Culture involves shared understandings of symbols and their meanings that allow us to communicate, to cooperate, and to predict and understand one another's actions. And yet, while culture is shared, it is not equally distributed among all the peoples of a society. Different life experiences within a cultural system can lead people to develop distinctly different patterns of belief and behavior. We call these microcultures or subcultures, and one person uh, may well be a part of multiple uh, microcultures. But these subcultural differences are almost never equal. A very common cultural process in all societies is the mobilization of difference to create internal hierarchies in which some people have more status and more access to valued resources than others. Different distributions of cultural knowledge usually serve to produce and maintain differences in social positions, such as gender, race, class, caste, uh, or age. But in highly complex and diverse societies, Differences can also distinguish people on the basis of education, occupation, and even leisure. In most societies, rights, responsibilities, and control over resources are unequally distributed to people on the basis of these social categories. The mobilization of cultural symbols to create and sustain or resist such uh, social inequities is called ideology. Because culture is shared, 
but unequally distributed, every society must have mechanisms to deal with two crucial processes, the generation of similarity and the organization of difference. The generation of similarity involves those institutions and processes that teach and reinforce common beliefs, values, orientations, and models for action among the members of a community. So family, school, and peer groups, and mass media, among other institutions, serve as uh, key institutions for enculturating members of a society into the most deeply and widely held cultural symbols. But shared uniform beliefs and values are not necessary for many kinds of cooperative activities. People from very different backgrounds can share a bus in a multi-ethnic neighborhood in Chennai, India. They simply need to know the rules for bus riding. Institutions concerned with the uh, organization of difference include most political and social organizations who have the power to regulate behavior and reward or punish behaviors that are deemed by the society to be too different to be members of the society. Now, the fact that not all cultural knowledge is equally shared by all members of a society draws our attention to the fact that we don't simply possess culture by virtue of being born into society. We learn our culture as we live and work and grow. Which aspects of our society's total cultural repertoire we learn depends to a large extent on our unique experiences growing up. And yet those experiences are in turn shaped by society insofar as we're raised in similar ways and passed through similar institutions like hospitals, schools, weddings, and funerals, we share common sets of cultural knowledge, values, and assumptions. Insofar as our experiences differ because of unusual family structures, differences in wealth, exposure to different areas of society, our cultural knowledge is different. The processes by which members of a society pass on culture to new generations is called enculturation. Uh, sometimes this is differentiated. Learning to live uh, in a society according to that society's rules is often called socialization, whereas enculturation is often reserved to refer to people's coming to terms with the systems of ideas and values uh, that undergird many of those systems uh, and that are part of the, widely, the most widely shared cultural uh, systems. One aspect of enculturation is formal learning, the acquisition of cultural knowledge that takes place within institutions that are specifically designed for that purpose, like schools or apprenticeships or on-the-job training. Every society has institutions that exist primarily to pass on to children very specific skills that they need as adult members of that society. Now, I hate to tell this to you because you've spent uh, at least 12 years in institutions of formal learning, uh, as many as eight hours a day for those 12 years, but formal learning actually makes up only a very small part of your total cultural learning. Most, in cultural, most enculturation actually takes place through processes of what we call informal learning, the learning we engage in simply by watching and listening and participating in everyday activities. Consider, for example, how you learned to speak, uh, how you learned your taste in clothes, um, how you learned your eating habits, you know, how to eat, but also what tastes good and what doesn't taste good. Um, what kinds of things you should put in your mouth and shouldn't put in your mouth. These things are usually learned through observation, imitation, and gauging the responses of those around us. Our deepest cultural learning often actually shapes our bodies and our unconscious behaviors. It shapes how we speak, how we move, how we eat, how close we are comfortable standing to people. This kind of enculturation is called embodiment. An example of embodiment is accent. As you learn the language of your community, you train your whole vocal apparatus to easily and automatically produce a certain range of sounds. So, for example, if a baby is lying there in the crib and, and makes a sound like, ah, in an English-speaking household, that sound will be ignored. But if she makes a sound like, m the family will say, oh, she's trying to say mama, and they will reward her with smiles and coos. And the baby learns that ah 
is noise, but m is sound. But if she's in an Arabic-speaking family and the baby makes the a sound, they'll say, oh, she's making the ayin, and they'll reward her, and she will learn to make that sound. As a result, we actually train our vocal auditory apparatus to make some sounds and not others, to treat some things as noise and some things as meaningful sound. And then later, when we try to learn a second language, we find it very difficult to produce those new sounds, resulting in a foreign accent. That is, even though we're physically capable of making all the same sounds as any other human, we have trained our bodies to privilege certain sounds over others, so those other sounds are unnatural and uh, treated as noise. Similar kinds of embodied patterns can be shown to exist for uh, proximity, how close we stand to one another, gesture, um, how we walk, how we sit, what we wear or don't wear, and many other elements of our everyday lives. Embodied culture is especially important because it feels completely natural to us. It's not only difficult to change, it's often difficult for people even to become aware of. And yet, in spite of this, culture is not only capable of changing, it is always in a process of change. Enculturation does not refer only to the processes whereby children become socially adept members of a community. Cultural learning is a lifelong process, because cultural systems adapt to changing environmental, economic, political, and social conditions. All cultural systems change over time in response to shifts in context. Cultures change as they adapt to internal or external pressures. Internal pressures could be population growth, it could be uh, people who have been uh, oppressed, uh, trying to seize uh, control of a, a greater uh, amount of resources. External pressures could include uh, environmental shifts, famines, uh, or environmental shifts that, that produce more food uh, than is necessary. It could be war, uh, conquest by another people. Uh, it could be uh, any kind of uh, external factor that impacts upon um, a particular society. Cultures do not, however, all adapt to the same pressures in the same ways, nor do there seem to be any stages that all cultures pass through. Um, an important corollary of this that I talked about in the previous lecture as well is that there are no primitive or fossil cultures. Studies of uh, foraging societies have been very important in helping us to understand how all humans must once have lived, but contemporary hunter-gatherers aren't fossil societies. They have their own unique histories. For example, uh, the Kung people of the Kalahari Desert have a centuries-long history of being pushed south by fiercer, more warlike peoples. How they hunted and what they gathered changed as they got pushed from rich jungle environments full of fruits and nuts into increasingly inhospitable environments, and they had to adapt by developing new skills and new technologies for being good hunter-gatherers. Culture adapts to changing conditions in a number of different ways. Creativity is a fundamental human trait, and all societies have mechanisms for generating innovation from within. But at least equally important is the capacity of communities to borrow cultural innovations from other societies and adapt them to their needs. The diffusion of ideas and technologies and practices occurs through direct contact, like migration or conquest, but it also occurs through indirect contact, such as trade or mass media. It's important to recognize, though, that culture does not cease to be culture just because it borrows and adapts. When the Plains Indians adopted the horse and the rifle from their Spanish conquerors uh, and from traders and from settlers, they completely transformed their societies. They did not, however, become Spaniards. They became different kinds of Plains Indians. Today, it's not uncommon to see Coca-Cola franchises in Cairo or New Delhi and interpret them to be evidence of an emerging global culture, 
uh, globalization, a process uh, that some have even referred to as McDonaldization. But the McDonald's of Egypt is not the McDonald's of the United States. All right? For example, in the United States, McDonald's is a low-status, inexpensive, convenient restaurant that's designed to serve frantically busy lifestyles, low budgets, and the desire for places that children can go and eat with their parents. In Egypt, though, McDonald's is a high-priced, high-status restaurant that delivers food, caters parties, and is a favorite place for young cosmopolitan Egyptians to hang out. Although the restaurants share many of the same physical characteristics and serve uh, almost identical menus, those characteristics mean very different things in their very different contexts. Humans are tool-using animals, and culture is our ultimate tool. Culture is the tool that humans use to orient themselves in the world so that they can act effectively. Using culture, humans build complex physical and social structures. And because they then live within these complex physical and social structures, those structures help sustain and reproduce the cultural systems that produce them. We call this the structure agency problem. Okay, that is the relationship between the systems of institutions that we create as a society which shape the production of us as individual members of that society and in turn the uh, free ability to act that we individuals have that in turn shape the creation of those structures, those institutions. Agency, focusing on agency reminds us that people do not act according to their culture. People use culture to act. Culture is not a set of scripts or uh, programmed routines that we act out. Culture is a set of views and practices and strategies and orientations and plans and habits and perspectives that help us to engage in actions that are meaningful to ourselves, meaningful to others, and therefore that function to accomplish the things we need to accomplish within our own society. And one of the fascinating things is that when people use their culture to orient themselves in the world and to uh, set goals for themselves and to find strategies for adopting those goals, to uh, get a job and to create a meaningful life for themselves, they tend to reproduce with minor variations the same kinds of social institutions and cultural systems that produced them in the first place. Except when they don't, because cultural systems are also always in a process of transformation. One of the most interesting things about studying culture for me is looking at processes where people borrow ideas and practices and technologies from other societies and incorporate them into their own societies and in the process transform them, change them to make them meaningful uh, in their own cultural systems. It's what I study in Egypt and in India and in the United States. It's what I find fascinating about cultural anthropology and I hope you do too because it's what we're going to be studying a lot of over the next uh, rest of the semester.